There was a time when I thought I would not make it. All I could do was to fall down and pray. Through the problems and through the fears, I know Jesus was very near. By His grace, here I am today. Here I am, though battle scarred. Here I am, I come so far, and my faith is even stronger than before. Here I am, I made it through. Here I am. Lord, thanks to you, I'll never doubt your love for me anymore. There was a time when I did not didn't handle things the way I should. As I look back, I did not understand. Now I can see God's mighty hand, how he took something bad and made it good. tears and my faith is even stronger than before here I am I made it through here I am Lord thanks to you I'll never doubt your love for me singing that song, I, listening to the uh, words of that song, I was, I was applying it spiritually, but I was also applying it physically, and I think, you know, there's a number of us uh, uh, within this house today who have served in law enforcement, and, uh, you know, we can sit down and tell war stories and show each other scars, you know, this is where the knife got me, this is where the bullet did this, or this is where, we can sit down and show those things, and, and show those things that were inflicted upon us in, 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 in doing a job. And we as Christians, I hope we can show the same kind of things. Amen? I hope we can show that the inf where, where things have been inflicted upon us as we're carrying out the cause of Christ here on the face of the earth. And, um, and you know what? I hope that as you do it, that you're reverentially proud to do it. Sit back and say, yeah, you know, I remember when I went through this and I went through that and I was doing the Lord's will and I felt like Job in the, you know, in, in this, in this, uh, uh, this century. But praise God he used me for it, right? Yeah, amen. That's a hard one to say amen to, but uh, not many people want to do that nowadays. Allow us to pray, then we'll get into our message this morning. Our Father in heaven, Lord, you've challenged our heart. You've challenged this church. You've challenged this, 
this, this, this group of believers in this local ecclesia that you've planted here and you've challenged it for years, Lord. And Lord, may we rise to that challenge today as we hear what your word has to say to us. Father, thank you for your leadership. Thank you for the doors that opened for us. And thank you, Lord, for the saints that are willing to step through those doors. And now, Lord, we just pray that this time be a, a, a gracious time. We pray that it's a time of, of, of a great challenge to our spirit. We pray that it's a great time to edify and uplift our God and our Lord Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, I, have a, I know that, that it's, been, uh, it, it's been almost four years since uh, I was blessed to be able to come here as the pastor. And it, it feels funny to say come here, because to me this is home. So, uh, uh, but but the, the Lord did that almost four years ago, and when he did that, he, he left me, he started me with a firm foundation. A, a firm foundation here. And what I mean by that is we had a firm foundation of believers. And uh, small, but firm. And, and so there was something to build upon. And, and what a great thing that is when you have a firm foundation and something to build upon. I told my son-in-law yesterday at the basketball game, said I'm going to talk about you in a little bit of an analogy tomorrow just to let him know so I don't want him to crawl under the pew. And, uh, but he does concrete work. And I've watched him work, and that's a hard, hard work. It is hard work. For those of you who have labored and done concrete, you know it's a hard job. And uh, so, and, and, you know, it's one thing for those of us who might dabble in something that, like that and do it every once in a while. But when that is your livelihood, and that's what you do all the time, that's hard work, folks. Um, and, uh, you know, so if, if hard work scares you away, you're not going to make much of a living at that job. And uh, so, you, you know, on that note, as a father-in-law, I'm proud that he's a hard worker. I'm also proud that he's, 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 he's trusted in Christ as his Savior. But, but I understand what he does, and I've watched what he does, and, I, and working with him out here in the church, and watching what he did in the sidewalks, and seeing uh, as, he, as he graciously donated uh, his, his, his time and labor out here for the, to put in a foundation for that beautiful sign the Lord gave us. That's, those things are just great. And I see the, I see the concrete uh, that's been poured out there that makes for a firm foundation. A firm foundation. And I'm sure that every day that he goes out to work someplace and he's pouring that concrete, that's the idea. Make a firm foundation. And, and that, but that concrete has to be mixed up someplace, doesn't it? And usually back at the concrete plant. I've stood with him and watched him call the concrete trucks and here they come. But but they have to be mixed up at the concrete plant. Now I'm going somewhere with this. And, and, but then it needs to leave the concrete plant. Amen? And then it must be taken to the job site. And then it has to be spread, right? I'll use the word spread. Well, if you look on our sign out front, if you had an opportunity to read that when you're pulling into the church this morning, it says, most, most places have a professional code of ethics or they have a mission statement. And our mission statement is spreading the word of God. Real simple mission statement. Um, so simple it's hard to understand, huh? And I hope we can get past that a little bit this morning. If, if, if the concrete uh, that, that is being called for doesn't leave the plant, what does it profit? What does it profit? So if I can say to you this morning, now that I've given you all those little examples and analogies, when, we, when I, the Lord brought me here and gave me a wonderful family to oversee, to love, and to be loved by, when that happened, I got to come to something that left the plant at one day, and there was a firm foundation put down. And, and for that to happen. So we have a foundation in which to grow upon, which we know how that's gone. Amen? The Lord is good. The Lord is good. And, and we've watched the spiritual growth. We've watched the financial growth. We've watched the Lord bless us financially. And I'm not preaching any prosperity gospel because I'm not Joel Osteen. I'm telling you, though, we've watched the Lord. We've watched him 
increase us financially. This church, this church has very few needs. Amen? He, God has been good. But there's a reason he's been good. There's a reason. Because we're in his will. Get outside of his will, and we're going to have to do all kinds of things to try to get people to come in. We're going to have to sell stuff. We're going to have to do this. We're going to have to do that. We're going to have to entertain. We're going to have to do all kinds of things that we're not going to do, by the way. But the nice thing is we're not going to have to do that because he promises us. If we're in his will, he'll bless us. And we're seeing the fruits of that. The Lord has done something, and I've watched over the years as coming up on four years here. And what I've watched is he has given us a task. He's given us a task that involves, he's given us his word. He's given that to us. And as he's given us that word, it's, that's the plant. And now we have, that word has come out to us. But now we have to do what? With the word. We have to get the word out. Which means there's people that has to take it. Then when it gets there, there's people that have to, what? Spread it. And, and we see the work that becomes involved. You see, the cement plant doesn't find my son-in-law and his crew working. They're waiting. They're waiting until somebody brings it. God has given it to us. There's nothing to wait for, folks. He's given it to us. I see how he's challenged this church. This church isn't one that has a big bus ministry that's out with school buses, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's a wonderful thing, and always pray for the church, the good independent fundamental Baptist church. I tell Bethel Baptist Church pastor, I pray for your bus program. And if you need something, let me know. We will help if we can. You say, really? You told another church that? Uh-huh. I sure did, because that's a, that's a ministry. And I would expect to hear the same thing back. If it doesn't leave the plant, what does it profit? It's the same way with the Word of God. John 17, 17. If you want to turn there, you can. But in John chapter 17, 17, uh, that is truly our Lord's prayer. And He says, he, He's praying, sanctify them through Thy truth, Thy Word is truth. I'm going to go a little fast for you on this, so I apologize. Sanctify them. Set them, set them apart with truth. That's you and I, folks. That's those of us who know Christ as our Savior. Jesus prayed to his Father in heaven. Set them aside. Sanctify them with truth. And, 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 and there's only one thing that is truth in this entire world that God recognizes as truth. And that's his own word. Because he created us for his pleasure and he gave us the owner's manual of which to operate thereby. So the only thing he recognizes as truth is his word. If it's contrary to his word, it's a lie. It's the devil's lie if it's contrary to his word. So when we see that uh, John 17, 17 says to sanctify them through truth, that word is truth. That word is very, very important. It was a solid foundation at the New Testament Baptist Church almost four years ago, and it's still a solid foundation at the New Testament Baptist Church, and that foundation has grown larger. It's taking up more spiritual square feet than it has taken up in years. And that is not by us, but it's by our faithfulness to God. He has rewarded us in that manner. He has provided our needs financially to carry out something that he has given this ecclesia as a task. He's not given us the task of buying school buses and going all over the place, but he has given us the task of getting out his word. We've watched that build here. We watch it through our missions conference. We watch it through our partnership with Seedline International. We see it with the mission that we're on now out of this church, which, which funding, financing, prayers 
of the faithful saints in this house have made possible all of the things, the pictures in the, that you're seeing in the bulletin today, the, the next trip into Washington, D.C. with 50,800 copies of the gospel. It's God's money. God isn't giving us his money to not spend on his work. His work. His work. The world would look at us and say, you're going to pay how much for a hotel room to go take and pass out those booklets? That's what the world would say. But the believer's going, amen, that he would give us that money to be able to pay for a hotel room to go pass out those scriptures. <laughs> you see, that's the way it is. That's the way it is. And, and what a wonderful, wonderful gift it is. But that work, that work, it's taking the work. It's spreading the work. The Lord gave me a song a long time ago. I played on the guitar and sang and, and made you go like this. But, but it's, if you've read the word, if you've read the word, you've seen how he came to be, how he lived and died for us. Those of us like you and me, the father called out son, and from the word, he became to be. How wonderful this gift that would set us free. Amen? Amen. Um, spreading the word of God. You know, I want to share with you, if you'll look at Romans chapter 10, verse 17, most of you could probably quote it. If you know it by heart, you don't have to even go there. But Romans chapter 10, verse 17, I want you to see that on the heels of John 17, 17. As you're turning to 10, 17 of Romans, in John 17, 17, remember, sanctify them, set them apart, Father God, set them apart. Set them apart in your, your truth. Thy word is truth. And then when you look at Romans chapter 10, verse 17, if you're there now, you'll see that faith, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by Miss Mac, Miss, Mrs. Macarola's song? No. By the pianist uh, 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 playing the hymns? No. By, by the offertory? No. No. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing only by the word of God. There is no other way under God's heaven for somebody to come to know the truth of God but by his word. There is no other way. That is not a popular thing in the warm and fuzzy Christian realm. But it's the truth. So with that truth in mind and that foundation that we have here in that truth and the growth of that spiritual truth foundation that's, that's getting larger and larger and taking up more ground, literally, right next door to parcels that was given to us by God. It t a total of $882, and now First Energy has given us $1,200 just for an easement out front to cut trees that we don't even own. <laughs> I don't try to outthink God, but that's the way it's working out. <laughs> that must be paying for the hotel room in Washington. I don't know, but, you know, I don't try to outthink him. I want you to look at something. Look at, um, you've seen faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And that is the only way, my friends, I don't care how many roofs a mission trip puts on. I don't care how much food goes out the door during a, during a catastrophe. I don't care how many cases of water goes out. Oh, yeah, we should do those things. Those are good things to do. Jesus fed the poor. He fed the hungry. He healed the sick. I, I understand that. But none of those things got them saved. They had to hear his word. That's what got them saved. That's the only thing that has saving power. You can come to me during the altar call till the cows come home and I can't get you saved. This, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. This is what draws. It's not me. It's this. I'm just delivering the package, being used as a vessel. So we see through the word. 
Look at Revelation chapter 3, if I didn't tell you to go there, and I meant to. We're studying the book of Revelation on, on Wednesday nights. In Revelation chapter 3, I want you to look at verse 8, what Jesus has to say here. And, and, and so I can give some of you that are rusty, or you Bible scholars who just love to hear it again, or those of you who have never heard it. The three first chapters of the book of Revelation are a picture of the church age of which you set in. They're a picture of the church age uh, when the church was first empowered by the Holy Spirit of God at the day of Pentecost, back in Acts chapter 2, until in Thessalonians when he says that he'll appear in the clouds of glory and the dead in Christ shall rise first and those of us who are caught up who, are, who remain alive and will be caught up together with them in the clouds of glory. That's, we call that the rapture, rapture of the saints and, and it's a snatching away is what it is, and he's promised us that, those of us who, who are truly his children, uh, by salvation. But we see, we know something that, that in this church age, it's coming to a close, uh, like the little dialogue that Brother Cooper had with his wife. It's coming to a close. And you know what? Uh, that could be a good message, Brother Bob. You better take it to go. <laughs> uh, it's coming to a close. And it's very important, and it's nothing to be ashamed of. It's nothing to be ashamed of. And, and you know what? Every true born-again believer in Jesus Christ should be excited of what lies in store for them. If it scares you to death, and you don't have any peace with it, you might want to examine that thing you think you have that you're calling salvation. Revelation, Revelation chapter 3, verse 8. Jesus says, I know thy what, folks? Listen to what he's telling the church. He's talking to the church, the church, the church age. He says, I know thy works. I believe he's talking, I'm not looking in my Bible, I believe he's talking to the church at Philadelphia. Correct me if I'm wrong here. But, but he, he says, I know thy works. He says that to many of the churches. He says, I know thy works. Now, he's talking to, the, he's talking to his church. And he says, I know thy works. And this is going on before the rapture of the church. By the way, after chapter 3 of Revelation, the church is no longer spoken about because it's gone. It's totally gone. You're not, if you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you only have to worry about uh, uh, chapters 1, 2, and 3. Because after that, you're gone. The rest is the script that you get to watch from heaven. And then when you get to come back to this earth for a thousand years called the millennial reign. So in, in, in chapter 3, verse 8, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. I want, to put the, I want to put the face. I want to put the picture of our sign. I want to put the spiritual picture of the, of, the, of, the, of the indwelt Holy Spirit people in the church of the New Testament Baptist Church. I want to put our picture right next to that verse this morning. I want to put our picture next to that verse this morning. Works. God has set before this church an open door. And we're jumping right through it. And I'm, I'm, I'm so thankful that we are. I'm thankful that I'm not a pastor that's got to fight and tooth and nail for everything we try to do for God. But all I have to do is say it, and people are praying it, and they're giving to it, and we're doing it. He opened a door for us that no man can shut. I can't shut the door. You can't shut the door, so you might as well just jump in on it, right? That's the way I look at it. And that's what he's telling us here. He says he's, he's set a door before us, an open door that no man can shut. And that open door requires something. Work. It requires work. It requires work. And I'm here to tell you, for $9.95. No, I'm here to tell you this morning, but wait, there's more. <laughs> Ronco, all those people. I'm, I'm tell, here to tell you this morning that it's a work that there's not a soul sitting in this house can't do. So I got good news for you. You may have thought you were useless for the work of God, but I got news for you. It's, it's, there's, it's a work that there's not a soul in this house that can't do this work. And the Lord's put that on my heart. And now what's that mission statement out there? So, to spread the word of God. But we're not going to sit around 
while it's at the factory, we got to get it here. After we get it here, we got to go with it. And after we go with it, we got to take it to where it's needed. And after we take it to where it's needed, we have to spread it. And that's what we're going to be doing starting in 2017. That's what the God has opened the door for this house to do, laid upon my heart, given us all that we need. There's nothing that we need to be able to do it except willing hearts. That's all we need. He supplied everything else. Every single thing else. We're going to this presidential inauguration. See, that's what's happening. We're taking the word. We're taking the word that came from the plant. And, and we took it there. And we've placed it there. Now we're going to go back. And we're going to pick it up and we're going to spread it. We're going to spread it. And we're going to lay a foundation. That's exactly what we're going to do. And all of you are a part of that. But come 2017, this, this year, as we move along spiritually, you're going to become even more and more of a part of that, more than you think, more than you think. Because it's making it up at the plant and sending the concrete out doesn't do any good if you don't what? It doesn't do any good if you don't spread it. It just lays there and ends up being good for nothing. So we got to be able to spread it. We're each, when we look at verse 17 in this passage, in this chapter, look at verse 17. Jesus says, because thou sayest, I am what? Rich. Well, I'm going to tell you something, folks. The New Testament Baptist church is rich. Amen? We're rich. We're rich in spirit. And we are rich in what he has supplied to us in his wealth. You say, well, there's churches that could buy and sell us ten times over. Yeah, but you know what? We're able to cover all of our expenses here and have something left over. And what should we be doing with that something that's left over? It should be putting it to work for the Lord. And we're going to do that. We're going to do that this year. We're going to start on this real soon. And uh, so you'll be hearing a lot more about some of the things the Lord's laid on my heart. But we're rich. We're increased with goods. We really have need of nothing. But do we know that we're wretched? Do we know that we're miserable? Do we know that we're naked, poor, and blind if we do not realize the light of Jesus Christ? If we do not realize what he has opened the door for, then that's what we are. What causes something like that? Look at verses 15 and 16. Jesus says, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot, so then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Jesus is not saying, hey, New Testament Baptist Church, I want you to be cold. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying, I want you to be hot. He said, I would have rather you been cold or hot, but because you're lukewarm. In other words, what he's saying is, I reached for this cup that looks like it says pastor on it. It's, it's got my scripture reference right there. Matthew 25, 21. He says, I reached for this cup and I picked this cup up expecting this, expecting holiness to come out of this cup. And when I took a drink of it, it was not holiness and I spewed it out of my mouth. That's what he means with, I would rather you be cold or hot. You see, if, I mean, how, how many of us can say we've picked up a beverage sitting around the house or at the workplace and thought, oh, I picked that up, I thought it was going to be cold, man, it was really lukewarm, and went, what was that? That's what he's talking about. He doesn't, he's not saying, I want you to be cold. He's not saying, I want you to be hot. He says, I'd rather you've been cold or hot, but you're lukewarm, and I spewed you out of my mouth. When he looks at the New Testament Baptist church, he sees that we're rich. But we choose spiritually, I don't believe we do, but if we choose spiritually to be naked and blind, then we're not what he expects. He expects us to be what he wants us to be. He expects us to go through these doors that he's opened for us. We see here that, that we're, not, we're not supposed to be cold. We're not supposed to be hot. We're, he wants, he's using an analogy that we're not supposed to be spit out of his mouth. That's what we're not supposed to be. He wants to find us smelling good, tasting good. 
That's what he has. That's how he wants to find us. We look at verse 18. We use, we use that money for the cause of Christ. That may be rich, that clothes uh, with white raiment, and the shame of our nakedness is covered, and we can see the truth. When you look at verse 18, what's verse 18 tell us here? Verse 18 says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, I, that thou mayest be rich and white, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with thy eye set, that thou mayest see. What does that mean? That means he challenges us to use our money for his work. And he challenges us to use these bodies for his work. That's what he challenges us to do. And he tells us that right there in his word. Otherwise, he's going to spew us out of his mouth. We're not in that condition, praise God. We're not going to be in that condition if I have anything to do with it. Amen, Baba Louie. <laughs> Verse number 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. God has provided us. God has provided us. He's, he's prepared us, folks. He's opened a door for us out of this local ecclesia to do a work for him that we are able to do, and we're going to start doing it. Whatever it is on our, in our life that we need to turn away from to start working for God is what we must do. And I'm not saying it's not what I'm asking. I'm saying we must do that. There's going to be coming plans and announcements. And I want, you to, I want you to look at verse 20 through 23 with me. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice, hear my voice. Whose voice? How do we hear him? Through the word of God. That's the only way. You know, we can amen, we can pray, we can confess, we can repent. We can do all those things here today at this invitation and at this altar call, and not a single one of those things is going through that open door. Not a single one of those things is going through that open door. And I say it again, not a single one of those things is going through the open door that he's prepared for us to do a work. A work. That's the foundation. That's the factory. We've got to take it out. We've got to spread it. And that's what we're going to do. And we're going to see that when we look in these chapters, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. That's a salvation call, by the way. That's a salvation call. That's, God, that's, two, that's a couple of things. That's a rededication call. That's a salvation call. It's a salvation call because the Holy Spirit of God uses his word to go, on your heart's door. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If you can get a mental picture of that and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, He's standing outside your heart's door going, If any man hear my voice and open the door. You see, you've got to open the door, my friend. He's not going to do that one for you. You got to reach the doorknob in your heart, open the door, and just let him in. It's all you have to do. I will come into him and will sup with him, and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to set with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. I cannot wait. I am so excited, as our song leader comes, I am so excited to be able to see what we're going to do out of this house. And I, the little glimpse that I'm going to share with you is we're going to get into the business of getting John and Romans and whole Bibles into this church, and then we're going to get into the business of getting them out of this church and spread. Amen? Amen? And I'll tell you how we're going to do that as soon as I get all the things ironed out. It's going pretty smooth. And then, then we'll see who's going to do it after I tell you how we're going to do it. 
Amen. Let's stand and sing an invitation song. If you need to come to this altar, if you need to come first and foremost, you say, you know, I've been a religious person all my life through my adulthood. I want to tell you that it was religious people that hung my Savior and killed him. I want to tell you it was religious people that took him off that cross. I want to tell you it was religious people that carted him off to that tomb. And it was religious people who paid off the soldiers to lie about the truth that they saw at that tomb. I don't believe those people are going to be found in a very pretty state when they stand before Christ. It's the simple person. And I don't come much simpler than anybody else here. It's the simple person that can look at the Lord and say, God, be merciful unto me, a sinner. Because I'm a sinner. But I'm a sinner saved by grace. What grace is that? It's the grace that that God man, that Jesus Christ, they, they took down off that cross and put in that tomb. That's what I believe in my heart. Why do I believe that? Because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by his word. And one day when I heard that word, I believed in my heart that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh, called the Son of God. Imagine that. I believed in my heart when he said, you, like, you believe in God, believe also in me. And I believed when he said, you love me? I go to prepare a place for you, Bob Burgess. And I believe that with all my heart. And I ask him to forgive me for the time that I didn't believe that. And it's that simple. That's the truth of his word right there. If you're that person here today, don't be ashamed of him. He wasn't ashamed of you. You come. Kneel down and let us pray with you. Maybe you're that person today that says, hey, I've been standing on this strong foundation. I need to rededicate my life. I need to be able to get charged up. I need to be able to start walking through that door. The Lord's open for us. I need to be a team player with God's people. I've gone too long my own separate ways of just showing up for church and then coming back at the appointed time. I need to start doing something for the Lord. Maybe you need to rededicate your life. Or maybe you need to come and say, Lord, I thank you for everything I heard today and I'm going to kneel down on my knees and I'm going to pray and I'm going to give it to you. And now I'm on fire and it's time to go. Whatever the need.